Now, it was the Mid-Continental Regional Education Laboratory, which recently changed their name, that was in charge of putting together the national curriculum. They called it the standards-based movement. Now, No Child Left Behind, again, as I say, it pretends to sunset this, but let me show you how it enforces the national curriculum. It says that the standards are voluntary. We all heard the term voluntary national standards for so long. Well, No Child Left Behind mandates that districts will be held accountable to the nation's report card, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Secondly, they tell us that the National Assessment Governing Board's policy mandates that the content of NAEP reflect voluntary national standards. Folks, when you mandate something that's voluntary, it's no longer voluntary. Michael Chapman, American Heritage Research. This video is part of a set that deals with the United Nations Agenda 21 program. In this video, Mr. Chapman shares his shocking research about the development of what we now know as Common Core Standards-Based Curriculum. Common Core is part of the UN globalist Marxist One World Government Plan known as Agenda 21. Start our second session this afternoon. You heard this morning about all the plans to uh, transform your communities and rob your property and uh, uh, rip your, your whole communities apart uh, in the name of sustainable development and smart growth. Uh, the question was, has been asked many times how uh, the people who are perpetrating these things expect to do this and make it last when you have a nation of people who were raised and educated on individual rights and uh, the Constitution and so forth. And the answer to that is that you steal a generation of children and you indoctrinate them so that they accept these ideas and they become global citizens in the coming global village. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about here this afternoon. Michael Chapman is an educational researcher and an author. He is also a member of the board of the Maple River Education Coalition and founder of the American Heritage Research. Uh, through research and study, the Maple River Coalition is finding a direct link between the restructuring of our schools through federal programs like Goals 2000 and School to Work and the restructuring of our communities through sustainable development. Michael Chapman and his group have discovered that today, as revealed in the National Curriculum Standards, education is no longer about preparing our children to maintain true liberty in a sovereign America. Instead, it is about indoctrinating our children to accept citizenship in a future global village. Today, Michael Chapman comes to us from Minnesota to uh, reveal how the so-called standards movement masked the true agenda to a tra radically transformed America. Please welcome Michael Chapman. Thanks, Tom. Thank you all for sitting in this long. Uh, it's been a long day, and you've heard some great speakers. Uh, you know, I couldn't help but uh, sitting back in the back of the room listening to Michael, uh, Sean, Michael Kaufman, and some of the local folks, I was back there just rapidly adding stuff to my presentation, trying to figure out what can I take out now to make room for it. So I'm really going to move fast. I'm very graphically intense on my presentation, so you'll, you'll want to be somewhere where you can see this board. Um, uh, I want you to know that uh, we in Minnesota consider ourselves members of the People's Republic of Minnesota. And for Michael Shaw's benefit, of course, that's the Midwest version of the left coast. Um, but uh, realistically, Minnesota was the very first state in the nation, in fact, the only state in the nation, to sign the Declaration of World Citizenship back in 1971. Now, this was the same year that the EPA was instituted. And by the way, the, the, the gentleman who was the first head of the EPA was a man named William Ruckelshaus, who was the American uh, ambassador to the World Commission on Environment and Development. So there's a lot of dots being connected through these things, and I'm going to connect the, the education dot for you. Now, I just want to go on to say that uh, the state of Minnesota actually, as declared in this document, actually flew the UN flag over the state capitol building. Now the citizens went ape. Here's actually a, a, a newspaper article showing that flag. The citizens went ape. So it wasn't uh, too surprising that a year later we came out with the first environmental education plan. 
This is it. Now, uh, one of the speakers I travel around the state speaking with is now a senator in Minnesota. So I got this document from her. I asked her if she could get a copy of it out of the archives at the Capitol, and sure enough, she did. She also sent me a copy of the original Declaration of World Citizenship that includes signatures. What you'll find out is from every single leader in politics in the state of Minnesota. Both House and Senate minority and minor, uh, majority leaders uh, are, are representatives. Everyone, Hubert Humphrey signed this thing. Everybody signed this thing, thinking this was a wonderful thing. So it's not too surprising that the paper was all behind this and quoted George Bush, the con country's new UN ambassador, uh, said this, it is President Nixon's deeply held conviction, which I share completely, that the whole UN system must be strengthened in the field of peace and security, social and economic development. Now keep in mind, this is before the term sustainable development was in vogue. Uh, that was a marketing term that cost the taxpayers millions of dollars to come up with in order to mask what this really is. Uh, this has been in our curriculum since then, uh, and it's been nationally in our curriculum since 1994, every single classroom in America. In fact, I have uh, challenged teachers uh, as I travel around to, to say, show me any textbook, any subject, any grade, any page, and I will show you blatant propaganda uh, meant to transform this nation. Uh, Lincoln once said the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of government in the next. We are reaping the consequences of having turned a generation of children over to this new system. Um, it's not too surprising then that UNESCO in their September 2003 conference on education for a sustainable future um, came out and declared 2005 to 2015, the decade of education for sustainable development. You will be hearing this term everywhere you go from now on for the next 10 years. Education for sustainable development. And surprise, surprise, they named UNESCO the lead agency uh, for that effort, who said their goal is to integrate sustainable de development into all levels of education in order to promote education as a key agent for change. Now, what does that mean? If you go to the UNESCO's website on education for sustainable development, you will find out the new role of education. They state, chapter 36 of Agenda 21 embraces all ways in which people learn about the world around them, develop the values and lifestyles, and assume their responsibilities as global citizens to prepare for the future. Now that's why I title my talk, Preparing Our Children for Global Citizenship. It is the right term, it is the right definition for the marketing word, sustainable development. And it encompasses more than just environment, as you've heard so far. They go on to say education is the primary agent of transformation towards sustainable development. Uh, at the, the U.S., at the cost to the taxpayers of quite a bit of a $400,000 grant, I believe it was, we have developed the toolkit for education for sustainable development. And I apologize, I covered up the slide with the box that shows the economy, the society, and the environment as the three parts of the system. As you saw, uh, I think it was Michael Shaw in the three-circle graphic. Uh, it says, from the time sustainability was first uh, sustainable development was first endorsed at the UN General Assembly in 87, again, this document, the parallel concept of education to support sustainable development has been explored. That's a lie. It has been fully embedded in our curriculum in Minnesota since 1968. It's been fully embedded in the curriculum in the entire country since 1994. I'll show you how that works. But they go on to say that it will encompass the 40 chapters of Agenda 21. That is your federal national curriculum, the 40 chapters. Now, 36, chapter 36, deals with education, but it is to encompass the principles contained in all 40 chapters. Um, the toolbox goes on to tell you, by the way, this was written in July 2002, so it's fairly recent. Um, goes on to tell you that world citizenship is the goal. 
And world citizenship encompasses the constellation that is all the principles, values, attitudes, and behavior that the people of the world must embrace if sustainable development, i.e. global citizenship, is to be realized. Now this is a bureaucratic revolution in education. The prime bureaucracy is the U.S. Department of Education, which was instituted in 1979 by President Jimmy Carter as a promise to put the principles of a sustainable development in place before the term was coined, but this was the entire purpose of the U.S. Department of Education, now I believe the world's largest employer. Uh, under its direction is the Office of Education Research and in Improvement. They oversee the 10 regional education laboratories. You can go to their website and see these are the 10 regions of the U.S. And each region has a director and a directorate to be responsible for each piece. Now it was the Mid-Continental Regional Education Laboratory, which recently changed their name, that was in charge of putting together the national curriculum. They called it the standards-based movement. Um, this, for instance, is the social studies uh, curriculum uh, that states that it is clear that the dominant social, economic, cultural, and scientific trends that have defined the Western world for five centuries is now leading in new directions. What were the ideals that define the Western world? We are now saying that's old business. We're now moving in some new direction. They go on to say the primary purpose of social studies is to help young people develop the ability to make informed and reasoned decisions. Who gets to define informed and reasoned decisions? For the public good as citizens of a culturally diverse democratic society in an interdependent world. Now this is all marketing gobbledygook that has real meaning underneath it. Sounds bad to you and I who are a little more in tune than the rest of the world and what this stuff really means, but keep in mind, we spent millions of focused market research to come up with the language to mask the agenda. The agenda is exposed by looking at the curriculum. But first I want to, to play a little video clip of the senior director of the Mid-Continental Regional Education Laboratory in 1989 as she revealed to the National Governors Association the agenda for education. She's going to list three important aspects of what education is about. Listen to the, for the three. It seems to me that far too much of our efforts have been focused on the issue of let's find a short-term fix and fix up these schools and taking care of them, rather than the issue of understanding that what we're into is a total restructuring of the society. What is happening in America today and what is happening in Kansas and the Great Plains is not simply uh, a chance situation in the usual winds of change. What it amounts to is a total transformation of our society. And the issue for most children and the issues for the society is that what has changed in education today is that we no longer see the teaching of facts and information as the primary outcome of education. During the past 10 years, we've been going through a reform movement. And that reform movement began with the governors of the nations, uh, the nation, and basically, what their concern was, was that they began to understand the very close relationship between economic development and human capital. Did you catch the three parts? Number one, the total transformation of society. Number two, facts and information, knowledge, is no longer the primary purpose of education. And number three, the close connection between economic let's call it sustainable development, and human capital, that is labor, human resource labor for a planned economy. Now, it shouldn't surprise you then to see this information in the Minnesota 72 plan. She said we've been working on this for over a decade. That was in 70, or 89. It goes back at least to 79. I have information that goes back to 1933, folks. Uh, but. Uh, it says environmental education is a new way of thinking. It is a lifelong process. How many have heard the term lifelong learning? Uh, 
It goes on to say that it requires basic cultural changes and the responsibilities must be shared by governments, schools, and businesses. Now the way this is being done is through something called public-private partnerships. We've heard a little bit of that term. But this is a public-private uh, partnership between government, education, and the economy or business. Reinventing government, education, and business. Now the, the interesting thing to ask here is what happens when you're in partnership with an 800 pound gorilla? The purpose of the other partners is to feed the gorilla. And that is in fact what is happening and what we're seeing taking place. Now the first piece was Goals 2000 that finalized the plan that changed the purpose of education in content. I often say there's only two problems with education. It's content and it's structure. We fix those two things and we fix education. The content piece came through Goals 2000. That locked the entire curriculum. It gave us a national curriculum, a national test, a national teacher's licensing rule that all 50 states signed on to merely because of the promise of grant money. The second piece was School to Work, also passed in 94. School to Work created the, business, the partnership between education and the economy. Knowledge is now derived at structurally what the planners will see the future economic needs are going to be and retrofit our children into specific career clusters. How many have heard the term career clusters? The schools here in Maine are being, being restructured as well. They were one of the 10 pilot states along with Minnesota. By the way, under No Child Left Behind, uh, they have now renamed career clusters smaller learning communities. Doesn't that sound nice? Nice. And that, those are the grants now that your districts are applying for to help implement the same system. Now the third piece is less known, that is the Workforce Investment Act. That created the state and federal boards and it created the local investment boards in the various regions of your state to manage the whole thing. Now this Workforce Investment Act, the only thing I want to say about it is it brought in a new term that you need to understand, appointed representatives. Now think about that a minute. The boards are made up of appointed representatives of business, representatives of teachers, representatives of parents, representatives of labor, representatives. The boards are by law have to be 51% business representative, but they're all appointed. You see, in a free society, those groups should get to vote and elect their own representation. In a government tyranny, representatives are appointed to represent your interests. Read your documents. It's, I found it all over Maine. All over Maine. Every single one of your boards, whether it's the sustainability boards, anything, is appointed representation. That alone is worthy of exposure. Now let's move on. No Child Left Behind locked the entire thing in place at the pretense of sunsetting Goals 2000 and School to Work. Keep in mind, Goals 2000 and School to Work were originally passed with sunset dates. They were just a little late in sunsetting them. Think of it this way. It takes two booster rockets to get the shuttle in orbit. Once the shuttle is in orbit, they can reject or sunset their boosters. Now all you need is to maintain orbit. No child left behind. Is maintaining orbit of the shuttle of this system. It is the accountability measures put in place to ensure every state complies. Now here's one of the ways that you know, uh, all three pieces of the Goals 2000 School to Work Workforce Investment Act are all part of the single plan. You can't assume they're different ideas. They are all part of a single unit plan. Um, now, No Child Left Behind, again, as I say, it pretends to sunset this, but let me show you how it enforces the national curriculum. It says that the standards are voluntary. We all heard the term voluntary national standards for so long. Well, No Child Left Behind mandates that districts will be held accountable to the nation's report card, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Secondly, they tell us that the National Assessment Governing Board's policy mandates that the content of NAEP reflect voluntary national standards. Folks, when you mandate something that's voluntary, it's no longer voluntary. Right? 
Voluntary now means mandatory. Change your dictionaries. That's what it now means. Let's move on. Now, I'm going to go through the three parts of Shirley McCune's, and I'm going to go through them in reverse. First, the economic connection to education. This is our Minnesota State Education document that explains the three circles of this system. Note, it is education reform tied to workforce preparation and economic development. Look at the center, the three words in the center, school to work. School to work is the nut that holds the whole radical thing together. Now that has now been replaced with a new term, workforce investment boards. Isn't that convenient in the official documents? But it says that what it means for education is education now is to be key to one's ultimate life and work goals. Well, how do you know that? How can you shape someone's ultimate life and work goals through education unless somebody has determined your ultimate life and work goals? You see, in a free society, education is supposed to be a broad-based liberal arts education to prepare for whatever the future holds. This system says, ah, we alone know what the future is, and we're going to retrofit you with what you need to meet those needs. That's the difference between the two systems of freedom and tyranny. Now, the document goes on to say that school to work is a whole new way of thinking, a revolutionary approach that will recreate these concepts. Now, when I say it's a revolution, I'm called a conspiracy wacko in Minnesota. Well, I'll tell you what, that's because I'm a property rights guy, okay? That's what makes me radical. You know, the, the real radical writers are the Rockefeller Republicans who are helping put the whole system into place, too. The new mission of education in Minnesota states to create a seamless system of education and workforce preparation for all learners tied to the needs of a competitive marketplace. Notice it does not say free marketplace. China has a competitive economic market. They compete with us in the economic system. What's missing in China is freedom. You will not see the term free market anymore in any government document that's tied into this system. You will not. I can't find it. The only time I've ever seen it is in the history standards when they're talking about what has been. The new term is competitive economic marketplace. You don't have to be free to compete in a state planned economy. Uh, this is our blueprint and it tells us that based on federal and state research where job growth is anticipated, St. Paul Secondary Schools will consider six career clusters as the focus of their small learning environments. Now, in Minnesota's northwest region, this translates to taconite. So we're advertising people going into taconite mining production. That's the first mining step towards the production of steel. And they advertise with taxpayer dollars. Would you like to earn $65,000 per year in wages and benefits? Go into taconite. And all these high school kids are saying, hey, that sounds pretty easy for 65 grand. You know what the problem is? Right now, northwest uh, corner of Minnesota has 30,000 laid off taconite production workers who'd love to be earning $65,000. This is government planning 101. It doesn't work. In fact, you can see here on the government's own projection that taconite is a dying industry in Minnesota. But what do we really need? Burger flippers. You see, we need labor for service industry now. But this source is the same source that gave us the taconite brochure. You see, in a state-planned economy, the left hand often doesn't know what the other left hand is doing. They're confused. It doesn't work. Can you imagine if you were able to predict this kind of future to retrofit your children for the future needs, how brilliant you'd be at the market? <laughs> you know, these folks can't even get that right. How are they going to retrofit our children for what they perceive the future needs are? I want you to hear, though, how the left really believes they know the future. This is State Senator Steve Murphy. What we're seeing right now is that about 80% of all the jobs that we're going to have in the future, you're going to need some sort of technical expertise. Um, about 20% of the jobs in the future will still will require um, some sort of uh, four-year education or beyond. 
Uh, we're talking to doctors, the lawyers, uh, the administrators, the engineers, uh, those types that are changing are in the labor pool. The people that are actually doing the work, people call it menial labor, I, I don't. I, you know, the people that worked in factories, uh, people that uh, use their sweat and toil, uh, uh, you, you're going to be you're going to be splicing wires for at t or whoever. Um, and that's where the majority of the jobs are going to be in the future. And we need to have our students aware of that so that they don't make bad decisions after high school. Um, Can you believe what you're hearing? He knows the future. And the concept here is it's a waste of state resources to train someone beyond their station in life. This concept came out of the polytechnical system, by the way, of Eastern Europe. This was the idea that the state will train you for your specific station in life. Now, the best education was reserved for the king's and queen's children, those who would one day grow up and rule the nation. You see, the problem is, in America, we're supposed to be a self-governing nation. All of our children are the princes and princesses who will one day grow up to rule this nation. And they deserve that broad-based liberal arts academic education, whether they're a truck driver or a doctor and lawyer. Thank you very much, Steve Kelly. This is where we're at in the name of educational progress. Now, we call this the knowledge society. Peter Drucker, how many have heard of Peter Drucker? The new business in the guru industry. What book they don't talk to you too much about is his book, Post-Capitalist Society where he explains that in order to move from capitalism to a knowledge society, which, by the way, is marketing language for a labor society, education in the post capitalist society has to permeate the entire society, business, government. You recognize the pattern of the triangle. post capitalist society, as he says, requires lifelong learning. That term, by the way, was first coined by Vladimir Lenin. Lifelong education through the polytechnical system was his philosophy of education. Now, this is our recent document. This is just put out by the Republicans in 2002. This, of course, once again, says putting it all together, and of course it has the three-circle graphic right on the front as puzzle pieces, and it explains to us that the bottom line here of the, the outcome indicators, call it outcome-based government, is to finally get down to something called sustainable family income. Now, this has to do with the transference of wealth. It's simply not fair if somebody has more wealth than another. So we're going to define the terms of a sustainable income, and government will be in charge of giving that to you. The document actually says, never lose sight of equity. Remember the new definition of equity that was put up on the board by one of the previous Michaels? In our collective efforts to increase the overall economic vitality of Minnesota, we must not lose sight of equity or fairness based on need. Do you recognize that term, by the way? From each according to his ability to each according to his need. I'm going to give you a peek ahead to the curriculum because this is what they're teaching the children in second grade. The entire purpose of second grade social studies is to transfer loyalty from the family to the government and teach them about sustainable economic consumption. Needs and wants is what they call it. What are needs and wants? Well, oh, sorry. It says here that needs are basic needs that all people must have. Wants are things people would like to have, but they can do without. The concept here, as it grows up fully in the entire scope and sequence, is it's not fair for you to have your wants met until the entire world has its needs met. This is sustainable, economic, outcome-based government redistribution of wealth philosophy. Growing up a little farther into seventh grade, it becomes gross national product in the global government or the global economy. Uh, this is out of a Macmillan, mainstream, seventh grade textbook. Although the countries of the world are all linked by interdependence, not all of them share equally in the world's riches. Well, who's hogging all the wealth in this map that is based on size depending on gross national product? You see, this is a Marxist concept of the economy that there is only a finite amount of wealth in the world and we have to share equally. The problem is in a free society, wealth is created and grows and expands. But this is not the sustainable economy. 
Well, it's just like the environment wants to suppress development, the sustainable economy wants to suppress the creation of wealth to be managed through our human resource generation uh, workforce investment councils. Uh, by the way, uh, like I said, Minnesota is one of the states on the cutting edge, so was Texas, so was Maine. And this is fully embedded in the Maine education system. The book explains that Maine also is designing a school-to-work system offering structured technical training pathways for young people. Here's the quote that gives you the 80-20 that you heard our senator say. It's all the same. Every state has the same talking points. And then your governor goes on to tell us that the residents of Maine are increasingly aware that our education system must prepare students to meet unprecedented society and economic demands. To do so, all students must have the knowledge, skills, attitudes that are outlined in Maine's common core of learning. And as you all well know, that is now called learning results. It's all the same thing. It's just repackaged under each new administration to make you think there's a new plan. It's all the same. And it's exactly the same in every state I've ever been in and research. It takes me five minutes to research a state because I know what I'm looking for. And I can find it so easy. By the way, that's all I'm going to deal with the school to work system. Uh, our video that is uh, Senator Michelle Bachman and I is guinea pig kids available here or at our website at edwatch.org. Um, moving on, the transformation of education. Education for a sustainable future requires a change in approach in the teaching and learning process. This brings us to number two, and that is the idea that preparing American youth for the 21st century requires a radical departure from traditional classroom instruction. Above all, it requires a shift in long-held beliefs that the role of the teacher is to transmit knowledge to the students. Instead, teachers must view themselves as facilitators through which young people construct knowledge themselves. Now, that's a long way of saying indoctrination. But the problem is, this came in, out of ni 1989, by the way, by the Carnegie Council on Adolescent Development and is the plan now for our education system. Uh, the research link that I use is out of our State Department of Education who did a research on performance-based instruction called constructivism. It tells us uh, basically constructivism means postmodernism. Uh, there is no truth. Students construct their own understandings of reality and realize that objective reality is not knowable. So why bother? The truth is the truth which keep men free is being suppressed in order to prop up the attitude training agenda. And it moves on. Uh, you can see this through the final subject to fall by the national standards is education. This is our new uh, math in Minnesota called Connected Mathematics uh, based on the National Center of Tr Teachers of Mathematics. Standard 3 tells us that students learn that mathematics is man-made, that it is arbitrary, and good solutions are arrived at by consensus. No lie. There is no truth, not even in math. <laughs> Most of us assume 2 plus 2 is always going to equal 4. You're wrong. We might reach a new consensus. Consensus is the theme that is more important in math than math. Now keep in mind, this is based on a shift in worldview. Mathematic was not a self-existing truth discovered by man, and the secrets of it unlocked. It was a social construction to meet society's need. This is the shift in thinking about all of our curriculum today. They're all based on the postmodern or constructivist approach. Uh, how well does it work? Well, they tell you in the teacher's guide in the back, it tells us that because the curriculum doesn't emphasize arithmetic computations done by hand, some students may not do as well on tests assessing computational skills. We believe such a trade-off in the favor of CMP is very much to the student's advantage in the world of work. You see, we don't want children who can think about the numbers behind the buttons. We simply want children to be prepared to, to know which buttons to push. That's why the new cash registers at the fast food have pictures on them, not numbers. Our children are mathematically illiterate on purpose. How do I know on purpose? Why isn't this just a basic bad idea? 
because the Sustainable Development Plan tells us so. Generally, more highly educated people who have higher incomes consume more resources than poorly educated people who tend to have lower incomes. In this case, more education increases the threat to sustainability. Charlotte Iserby, I owe you an apology. I did not believe for the longest time it was a deliberate dumbing down. I thought the dumbing down was a natural consequence of a bad idea. Folks, it's deliberate. It's deliberate. So UNESCO tells us, indeed, in the 21st century, the literacy of sustainable development will be as essential to comprehending the world as were, past tense, the traditional skills of reading and writing at the start of the 20th century. Folks, this is real. It's happening to our children as we sit here every day, day in and day out. Goes on to say the effectiveness must ultimately be measured by the degree to which ESD changes the attitudes and behaviors of people, both in their individual roles and in their collective responsibilities and duties as citizens. And so we see the truth of this matter in a picture uh, that was sent to us at Maple River Education Coalition. This central school model says the aim of education is the knowledge not of facts, but of values. And in fact, we were given this at a school to work conference put on by the state of Minnesota, defining performance-based instruction, which by the way is just a new term for outcome-based instruction, which said that learning has not taken place until behavior has changed. It goes on to tell you that values, attitudes, and interests can be learned and taught, and they can be objectively evaluated. How do you do that unless somebody knows the outcome attitudes that are desired? Well, the way we measure that is through something called an assessment. Has anybody heard of the term assessments? You ever wonder why they changed that term instead of test? You see, the thing is, test is a measure of objective knowledge. What do we assess? We assess our houses for its value. We assess our cars for its value. Folks, we are now assessing our children based on their value, perceived value to society, based on how well they now demonstrate that they think like a globalist. That's the meaning of assessment. That's what we're doing to our children. Now, No Child Left Behind made it a federal offense for me to show you the NAEP test, so I can't do that anymore. But what I will show you is the results from this National Center for Education Statistics document that assessed the percentage of children who now believe it's government's responsibility to take on economic concerns. Keeping prices under control, 84.2% of America's ninth graders now believe it's government's responsibility to set prices. The curriculum is working. Providing industries with the support they need to grow. Supporting business, 66.2%. The curriculum is working. Guaranteeing a job for anyone who wants one. Government's responsibility. The curriculum is working. And finally, reducing differences in income and wealth among people. 63.5% of ninth graders. Tomorrow, citizens voters and government officials now believe it is government's responsibility to redistribute wealth. The curriculum is working. It tells us that the assessments were not designed to measure knowledge of a particular country's government, but were developed instead to measure knowledge and understanding of key principles that are universal across democracies. Are these the key principles of democracy? I think not. Not the American version of a republic, by the way. Read Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. Guaranteeing a republican form of government, not a democracy. John Adams called democracy the devil's very own form of government because he said the most famous democratic vote in all of history was crucify Christ. And the government even knew he was innocent. That's democracy. That's why our founders were afraid of it. 
Who was the first man to call for worldwide democracy? Karl Marx. Did you know that? Well, how could kids think this way? Look at the national standards of economic uh, uh, curriculum. By the way, the voluntary mandatory national standards. Standard 16 says, students will understand that there is an economic role for government to play. Governments often define and protect property rights. Ooh, there's a tricky one. See, they got the word protect in there, but who defines the property rights? Government. If government defines property rights, there is no such thing as private property. Most government policies also redistribute income. This is true, but it's supposed to be a good thing here. <laughs> who wrote these standards? Well, the National Council on Economic Education and the Economics International Program. These were to be based on a consensus process. Well, again, how can ninth graders be so easily convinced? You know, a famous man named Lenin once said, take away a people's heritage and they're easily persuaded. Easily persuaded. So the very first subject that fell was history. The National History Standards tells us one of the most common problems is the compulsion students feel to find the one right answer. Or worse yet, they rush to closure reporting back as self-evident truths the facts or conclusions presented in the text or document. Now think about that for a minute. What would our founders say to this? You know, those are the guys who talked about self-evident truth. This is the worst problem a child could have, reporting back as self-evident truths. You see, the principles of the Declaration of Independence stand in the way of this entire agenda, so it must be eradicated. You know those seven principles of the Declaration, don't you, all by heart? National sovereignty, natural law, self-evident truth. All men are created equal. By the way, he didn't mean the gender. He meant mankind, both male and female. Creator given unalienable rights. That included life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or property. Government's purpose to secure these rights. And finally, popular sovereignty, the consent of the government. These are the principles that stand in the way of sustainable development. So this is the big debate in Minnesota right now. Because of the 30,000 strong Maple River Education Coalition, we have now repealed, been the only state to repeal the Goals 2000 curriculum. The debate now shifts to the replacement principles. We managed to get all of the Declaration principles in the House version passed, failed in the Senate. When it came out of conference committee, they were gone. When the chairman of the Joint Committee was asked why they weren't there, here was his response. The Declaration has no legal status in defining people's rights. None whatsoever. He repeated that on the floor of the Senate, by the way. But see, I'm a collector of rare founding era books. This is an original John Quincy Adams explaining the connection between these two great documents. John Quincy Adams put it this way. He said that the virtues which had been infused into the Constitution of the United States was no other than the co uh, co uh, concretion of those abstract principles which had been first proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, namely the self-evident truths of the natural and unalienable rights of man and the dissolvent sovereignty of the people always subordinate to a rule of right and wrong and always responsible to the supreme ruler of the universe for the rightful exercise of that sovereign power. He went on to say, this was the platform upon which the Constitution of the United States has been erected. Its virtues, its Republican character consisted in its conformity to the principles proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence. Folks, we celebrate the birthday of this nation on July 4th, not August 7th. That's because the Constitution was the working papers that put in place the principles contained in the Declaration. This document was written only in order to form a more perfect union. Without the Declaration, 
It's meaningless. Or it can be made to mean whatever you want it to mean. And that's what they're doing through the education system. They are shaping our thinking by doctoring up the Declaration Principles. This is a fourth grade uh, book that explains a critical thinking question. By the way, what does critical thinking mean if there is no self-evident truth? We assume it means learning to discern the truth. But a self-evident truth doesn't exist. It becomes a tool for shaping thought. And here's an example. Well, this is a teacher's guide that tells us that this section describes it as thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe and what to do. Now, that's with a predetermined outcome. And here's some of the examples. I'm only going to do one. That's all I've got time for. Ask students to think of a law they would like to see passed. Suggest the environment, endangered species, education, those things that are important to sustainable development. Uh, here's a teacher's uh, assignment. Divide students into two or three groups. Have each group work together to produce a bill of rights for animals. Tell them to begin by discussing the ways in which they feel animals are sometimes treated unfairly. Folks, this is the lesson during the study of the Bill of Rights. This is what the kids are doing in their classrooms. Mainstream, this is Houghton Mifflin. It's not some obscure little textbook company. Well, without the Declaration Principles, you can redefine, well, you redefine the Declaration Principles if they're mentioned at all. This one says when Jefferson wrote that all men were equal, he really meant all citizens, women and blacks, were not included. This is a politicized version of the meaning uh, using 20th century definitions for 18th century words. Very common tactic used by the publishers. Um, without the Declaration, what is the philosophy of our government? Well, according to the textbook, Enlightenment thinkers in the American colonies were excited. Here they were, the first people in history to have a chance to create an entirely new government based on Enlightenment principles. That, by the way, was the principles that founded the failed French Revolution. Uh, it is not the foundation principles of our document. Well, what evidence do they give you? They tell you that a study was done of 15,000 political writings published in America, and a tally was, it was uh, taken, and they found out that the most quoted source was French philosopher Baron de Montesquieu. Uh, then David Hume and John Locke. The problem was, I knew this was wrong, so I got the original study published in this book, and they actually show that Blackstone was number two at 7.9%. Now, why did they censor out Blackstone? Well, because Blackstone is the author of the commentaries on the laws of England, and he was the one who gave us the phrase, the laws of nature in Nature's God, contained in the Declaration. He defined the law of nature this way. This will of his maker is called the law of nature. This law of nature, dictated by God himself, is of course superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe and all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. Of course, we have to censor that, don't we? Because this is a violation, obviously, of separation of church and state, uh, which you know, doesn't show up in our Constitution. It is in Article 58 of the ex-Soviet Constitution. Uh, the study goes on to tell us, though, that the Bible was quoted 34% of the time, more than four times Montesquieu. That was just censored out, and the assumption then was left with, well, we must be based on the Enlightenment. The study went on to say, although the citations came from virtually every part of the Bible, St. Paul was the favorite in the New Testament, especially the parts of his epistle to the Romans in which he discusses the basis for and limits on obedience to political authorities. Folks, this is what justified the revolution. It was based on natural law, a higher truth than man. Whether you believed it or not, this was good for all societies. This did not mean that you had to believe what, the, what they believed. This is just what we were based on. To teach this in public school isn't establishing a church. It's simply history lessons. To leave it out is nothing short of censorship. And I cover a lot of this kind of documentation in my video, America's Censored Heritage. I'm not going to go through much more of that. Uh, let's move on. Without the Declaration pr Principles, the Constitution can be made to say whatever you want it to say, and that's the way they're teaching it to our children. Did you know you could change the Constitution without amending it? How many knew that? Well, that's what the lesson teaches. This is the gospel truth to children in eighth grade. Most popular textbook in America, by the way, up until 1994 when it was replaced by the better stuff. 
The Constitution is not a rigid document. Because of imprecise language in some sections, it's open to interpretations. Most historians, it's all, have you noticed it's always most historians? And you can't find one, but most historians feel that this is more of a strength than a weakness. Uh, it moves on to say, by unofficial change method is meant first the Supreme Court's interpretation, which differs sometimes from court to court depending on new justices. Now this makes perfect sense. I mean, if two plus two is four only by consensus, well, certainly the meaning of the Constitution is, uh, is going to be by consensus. Um, Postmodern activist Justice Breyer told us um, that the men who wrote the Constitution left many important areas open to interpretation. Breyer said in a speech Monday at New York University, did he learn his lessons in school well? He must have been paying attention in class that day in eighth grade. The philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of government in the next. This is what they all believe today. He went on to explain that judges should be wary of enforcing a strict reading of the Constitution. Well, we don't want to go to what the founders actually meant. We want to interpret it for ourselves based on what society needs today. He went on to say those more literalist judges who emphasize language, history, tradition, and precedent cannot justify their practices by claiming that is what the framers wanted. Notice, by the way, it's always framers, no longer founders, because foundation suggests something that doesn't change very easy. You can always remodel your house and build a new frame. Uh, the framers did not say specifically what factors judges should emphasize when seeking to interpret the Constitution. Well, unfortunately, Justice Breyer never learned his history. Otherwise, he may have written or read Thomas Jefferson, who on June 12, 1823 said, on every question of construction, carry yourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. And instead of trying what meaning may be squeezed from the text, conform to the possible one in which it was written. Pretty good advice from a founding father that is so dearly loved by the left. Well, what about the Ten Commandments case in Alabama? Anybody been following that? Let me ask you a question. What law did Chief Justice Moore violate? You know, they always say, oh, he violated the separation of church and state. But you know, that clause starts out by saying, Congress shall make no law. Is Judge Moore Congress? Who's closer to Congress, Judge Moore or the Alabama federal district judge? Which judge of these two violated the Tenth Amendment? You know that one that's no longer taught in schools. The powers not delegated to the U.S. are reserved to the states or the people. Justice Moore stood in front of the judge and said, I will remove those Ten Commandments now if you tell me what law I have violated. You won't hear that in the major mainstream media. The judge couldn't tell him one because the First Amendment guarantees there will be no law. How can you violate something that says there will be no law? Nobody knows this stuff, folks, because the media is part of the problem, isn't it? It's the reason, by the way, our founding fathers invented the committees of correspondence to get around the British-controlled press and get the truth out to the colonists. You see, this connection here in the Internet is our committees of correspondence, and we're starting to scare them a little bit. Thank God. Thank God for freedom. By the way, here's some Ten Commandments. Anybody recognize this building? It's the U.S. Supreme Court, the East Portocol, over, by the way, the title Justice, the Guardian of Liberty. Cornerstone document, the Ten Commandments, that Blackstone told us was the basis of natural law. We used to teach this in our schools, by the way. This is a... Uh, this is a really liberal state book. This is a Massachusetts textbook on government. It's a series of questions. Is there a higher law than the Constitution? The Constitution is the highest human law, but the law of God is the highest of all laws. To whom are the representatives responsible? To the people and to God. Do laws which restrain a man from doing wrong infringe on his liberty? This is my favorite. They do not because he has no right to do wrong. Profoundly simple if we taught that there is such a thing as right and wrong. We have replaced that now, folks. You know what with? Read your curriculum. Tolerance and intolerance. That's the new morality. 
And your children are being indoctrinated to tolerate all ideas as equal. That is the true meaning of the term. Look it up in your dictionary. That definition has gone through a metamorphosis. It no longer means putting up with something which is not acceptable, which is what it usually meant. It now means you must respect and honor the beliefs and behaviors of all. Look it up. It's changed in every dictionary I've looked it up in. If one were free to do right and secure against wrong, what would we have? Perfect liberty. It's what we had for 200 some years. The longest known successful form of government in the history of the world is the United States under its current constitution. Now we begin to redefine it, but it's still hanging on tight by its fingertips as long as we don't let it slip away from us. Without the Declaration Principles, the Bill of Rights means whatever. The best way to look at the true meaning of this amendment, Second Amendment, is to look at what the courts have said about it. Oh, really? Generally, the Constitution is considered to be a living document. No, it isn't. It's a bedrock document. Not anymore. Not under the current interpretation. It's shifting sands, and we're building our house on the sands, aren't we? Constitution is considered to be a living document, which means that the interpretation changes to meet the needs of the times. The judges and courts of each generation provide the interpretation of the document. In this case, the courts, the Second Amendment only provides the right of a state to keep an armed National Guard. A blatant, historic lie. Without the Declaration Principles, the Bill of Rights limit the people rather than Congress. May citizens enjoy rights that are not listed in the Bill of Rights? Keep in mind, they no longer teach the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. Teacher's answer? No. No. The Bill of Rights is now being interpreted to our children as a document that limits the people. Without the Declaration, government no longer secures our rights. It defines and grants them. Remember now, the national standards said governments often define property rights. Here's a good one for Mary Alice. The new way they're teaching it, zoning is a system of land control that gives governments the power to define and use land in certain areas. We heard how that shifted. Michael Kaufman did a beautiful job of explaining the shift that has taken place. It's been our curriculum this way for 15 years, at least. I've traced it back 15 years. Economic rights allow you to participate freely, which includes the rights to own property, but always subordinate to the government's right to, uh, to exercise its right to take property for pro public purposes. This is a direct quote right out of the curriculum your kids are learning from. This is the way it's taught now. If government defines property rights, there is no such thing as private property. There is only police power. And the police power allows the government to restrict the use of property through zoning laws or force an owner to give up his or her land. Folks, it's coming. This is what the future citizens, government leaders, are believing today. Governments sometimes use the power of eminent domain to protect the environment. Taking land for environmental reasons generally falls under controlling pollution or preserving natural areas. I look out before me and I see a fairly nice looking natural area. Five minutes. This is telling us that government has the right to take it based on that criteria alone. This is the next step in the progression of what we're fighting today. We may win the battle today, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can teach new dogs new tricks. That's what's happening. We're going to lose our nation even if we win today, if we don't get back education. Well, reorienting education, according to UNESCO, prepares students to transform society for the future a curriculum reoriented towards sustainability would place the notion of citizenship among its primary objectives. 
citizenship training with the right attitudes. That's the reason No Child Left Behind uh, names the Center for Civic Education as the only NGO allowed to write our standards for civics training. This is the federal curriculum, and all of its themes are embedded in every subject. The subjects are now just carriers for the federal uh, uh, themes. Uh, they also named the We the People program, also written by um, as America's model textbook. This is the reason most of your schools are using this now, because it's free. You've already paid for it through your tax dollars. Um, they also, by the way, are in charge of not just the standards and the curriculum, but they have the contract to write the NAEP test. So one NGO, nobody got a chance to bid for this contract, has the contract for the standards, the curriculum, and the assessment. And they will tell you, oh, by the way, CCE was a NGO started by this man, uh, Chuck Quigley, out of Berkeley, California. He's still in charge of it. This was founded in 1968, a radical leftist uh, group that wants to take control along with the UN. Uh, on their website, you can go and find out what teaching democracy globally, internationally, and comparatively for the 21st century mission of schools really is. They state, in the past century, the civic mission of schools was education for democracy in a sovereign state. <laughs> Old news, folks. Uh, in this century, by contrast, education will everywhere become more uh, global and international, and we ought to improve our curricular frameworks and standards for a world transformed by globally accepted and internationally transcendent principles. Those things which, according to these radicals, believe is central and, and common to all uh, such nations. Lowest common denominator, by the way. Um, if you want to read more about the federal curriculum, Alan Quist's book, Fed Ed, is a must read. Um, but let's start with the curriculum. It opens by telling you the primary purpose of this textbook is not to fill your head with a lot of facts about American history and government. Well, at least they admit it. They go on to tell you in their final chapter, always read the final chapter, it tells you where they're taking the kids. This lesson looks to the future. You focus on some major developments taking place in our society that are likely to affect the very nature of citizenship during your lifetime. When you complete this lesson, you should be able to explain how our nation's greater interdependence with the rest of the world is changing the pattern of civic loyalties. This is the real meaning of civics education and why it is endorsed by No Child Left Behind. Textbook goes on to tell you that we will be studying about the global village. And it ends by asking the question, what advantages might be offered by world citizenship what disadvantages? Do you think that world citizenship will be possible in your lifetime? Folks, if you read this book, the answer is, oh yeah, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. That's what our kids are learning now. Uh, this is a calendar in Minnesota, Apple Valley School District, that tells us that learning for a lifetime means our graduates will be global citizens who see themselves as part of an international community. This is the movement in education, and global citizenship is one and the same with sustainable development. Um, what they do is they de declare the Bill of Rights old-fashioned. Uh, the fundamental, as fundamental and lasting as its guarantees have been, past tense, the U.S. Bill of Rights is a document of the 18th century reflecting the issues and concerns of the age in which it was written. They go on to explain then that they are considered negative rights because they prevent the government from acting, which is true. But they go on to teach that it is doubtful that the founders had in mind an uncritical acceptance of the wisdom of the past. And it is within the sovereign authority of the American people to revise or abolish entirely the Bill of Rights. Now that I told to a very conservative U.S. congressman who said, well, you know, that's true. And I said, not if you believe that these are unalienable God-given rights. Only if you believe that they are given by man. And he was like, you know, you're right. I never thought of that. This was a U.S. very conservative congressman. What did they promote? The positive rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Why? Because instead of preventing the government from acting, they require it to act to ensure such things as economic security, health care, and a clean environment for its citizens. Isn't that wonderful? Well, see, folks, this is exactly what we're teaching and assessing our children. 
to ensure that they now believe it's government's responsibility to give us security, health care for all, in a clean environment. Government becomes God. Did you know by the Declaration of Human Rights declares a new God? Where do rights come from under the Universal Declaration? Article 29. Point three says, these rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. <laughs> it enumerates your rights and then it takes them away. Government becomes God. Now what is the duty of all followers of God? Follow God. What is the duty of citizenship? It means to serve your benevolent master. Citizenship now in the national curriculum is defined as the status of being a member of a state, one who owes allegiance to the government. One who owes allegiance not to the principles upon which freedom is based, that we may judge government, but government. This was exactly the defense of the Nazis at the Nuremberg trials. Exactly. The only way they were convicted is even then the international court, represented by U.S., appealed to a higher law than government. This is the true meaning of the rule of law. Law is king, not king is law. It's Lex Rex, Samuel Rutherford, his principles. Civic virtue, isn't that something we want to teach our children? <laughs> You're wary now. Not under the new definition. The dedications of citizens to the common good, even at the cost of their individual interests or rights. This is a Maple Grove seventh grade test. The term sovereignty refers to the absolute authority a government has over its citizens. This is a correct answer. Are they talking about the U.S. here? Neither the United States nor Russia are sovereign states. The right answer is false because our government has absolute authority over the citizens. How in the world can they believe that to be true? Take away a people's heritage and they're easily persuaded. That's how. Let me play a little clip from you from the debates in Minnesota that just happened over the writing of the new standards. Let me ask you, Senator Kelly, I also noticed missing from the current standards that was in the House version was also um, oh, other such principles such as national sovereignty, natural law, and free market enterprise. Uh, that would be something that we would be looking at as our, as our uh, commissioner takes up now the writing of the social studies standards. Why, why would your committee not include national sovereignty, natural law, which is referenced in the Declaration of Independence, and free market enterprise. Why would the committee fail to include those basic American principles, Mr. Kelly? Senator Kelly. Senator Kelly, Mr. President, Senator Bachman, like everything that happens in conference committee, it was a compromise. Okay. We just compromised away our freedom. They know, folks, the Declaration is key to winning this battle. That's why the fight in Minnesota is now over the Declaration principles. I want to recap real quickly. The Declaration principles versus sustainable development. National sovereignty is replaced by world citizenship. Natural law is replaced by positive law. Constructivism replaces self-evident truth. All people are equal before God is now replaced by multiculturalism. That is not celebrating different cultures who are here. That is declaring everyone different by their culture and all ideas are now equal. Equal opportunity was under one. Equal outcome is now the rule of the day. Creator given unalienable rights is now government defined rights. Purpose of government was to secure rights. Now the purpose of government is to distribute fairness. Popular sovereignty has been replaced with absolute power. 
Folks, I rewrote the Declaration of Independence years ago based on what I was learning in the curriculum. It is now we hold these concepts to be self-actualized, that all genders have evolved the same, and that based on their human nature, they are now entitled to certain basic rights, that among these are choice, license, and the pursuit of fairness. This principle is all over Maine's curriculum. I'm not going to go there because I don't have enough time. Uh, there are other principles involved, including emotional indoctrination. Uh, we have now declared that we are under the United Nations full-fledged members to support the goals. What we are doing is creating a synthesis of East and West under a new civilization which has declared a new civilization is emerging in our lives and blind men everywhere, that's you and I, are trying to suppress it. Uh, the book ends, from the wisdom we thank Mr. Jefferson who helped create the system that served us for so well for so long and that now must in its turn die and be replaced. The foreword to this book was written by Newt Gingrich. Folks, what is that system Jefferson gave us? The least religious of our founding fathers told us God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis from the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I realize God is just, and his justice cannot sleep forever. George Washington also warned us in his farewell address, whatever measures contribute to violate or lessen the sovereign authority ought to be considered as hostile to the liberty and independence of America, and the authors of them treated accordingly. Folks, this is treason. Yes. And it's time we say so. Yes. Thank you very much.